The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. As a new generation of parents struggles to balance home and work obligations, the need for dual income families is ever increasing. What will the effects of this trend be on childhood development? To find out, Policy Watch is joined by Dr. T. Barry Brazelton, a leading expert on pediatrics and child development. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. T. Barry Brazelton, welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Thank you, Doug. So Great to be here. Um, I'd like to read something that you wrote just to start us going because it was so striking to me. Um, I'd like them to remember me, that's you, as somebody who respected newborn babies and broke through a time in the 1950s when we were blaming parents for everything instead of looking at the interaction as the main potential for the baby's future. First, tell me about respect the baby. Well, I think um, when I started my work, I, I, I finished my training at Children's Hospital in Boston and didn't know a thing about babies and certainly less about parenting. This was training to be a pediatrician. I That's think, right? right. And all I knew about was disease or disorders or what was wrong with people. And uh, then I went into child psychiatry thinking maybe I'd learn more about children than about families. I didn't. It was another failure system. You only got to a psychiatrist if you failed. And the children we were looking at were three, four, and five. They were, uh, in retrospect, they were on the autistic spectrum, but we didn't know that much about autism then. And um, <clears throat> we were blaming parents for these children's failures. And that seemed so terrible. These parents were ready to take it. They were ready to blame themselves, and they got into therapy for year after year, but it didn't do any good. And I thought, well, now these kids don't look quite right to me as a pediatrician. I could see that many of them had really dysgenetic uh, features and so forth. So uh, I began to think maybe the child is part of this problem, not just the, pro the parents. And so I began to play with ba newborn babies and began to realize how really wonderful they are. My golly, when you pick up a newborn and they look in your face and you say, hi, how are you doing? That whole baby comes alive, sits up straighter, you follow your face back and forth. If you hold him up like this and say, hi, how are you doing? That newborn baby will turn to your voice, arch, and look in your face. And if I put a mother over there and I'm over here and we both talk, any newborn will choose the female voice, turn to her, look her in the face, and automatically she grabs her newborn. You know me already. And now I do it with fathers. Uh -huh. If you were gay, <laughs> we could play this game with a newborn baby. And 80% of kids turn to their father's voice instead of mine. Isn't that amazing? And the other 20%, I tip their heads. <laughs> so it's 100%. <laughs> it's 100%. And at that point, every father says, you know me, like it was a miracle. And you know, I think, golly, this is really what the baby brings, brings this capacity to capture parents for them. And isn't this fantastic? You know, our, our audience, the, the TV audience can't pick this up, but there are a number of women in the room who I know are mothers, newly mothers of children. In fact, we have one infant in the room. And you should have seen the mother's faces as uh, Barry was talking that way. It was a smile of recognition, uh, and it was really quite striking. How, how 
early on will a child react that way uh, to an adult, his mother or father, but also any adult. When can someone expect that kind of reaction from a baby? From a, new, from from a, a baby? newborn. Yeah. Newborn baby, right out of the uterus. You have to get them. I, I work with newborns all the time who are either addicted or not addicted because of their parents' addiction. And uh, the addicted babies show this same sort of attempt to master themselves. A baby who's been uh, in optimal conditions in the uterus will rouse themselves from sleep. And as they come up from sleep, they get more and more alert. And if they can't control themselves, they'll work to get their thumbs in the mouth. And then they'll look up like this. And all of this behavior is right there to be captured right from the first. In fact, we have... I have a newborn assessment scale that mm -hmm. I'm very proud of. <laughs> Called the and, Brazelton. Yeah. And it's in use pretty much around the world now to capture parents for their babies. And we have, oh, I don't know, 700 <laughs> papers showing that if you show a newborn baby to new parents, their passion, which is right there, ready, gets centered on that baby as a person. And you say respect, well, the baby tells you sort of what kind of baby they're going to be quiet, gentle, or active, and like this. And the parent learns to respect that baby's individuality right from the first. This is something that often comes as a surprise to parents. And, yes. and, and my sense from having chatted with you and reading your material, often parents have to be cued to see what they're seeing. Well, it certainly helps, and I'm, and I'm sure it has to do with having a professional share things with them. And I don't mean just a doctor. I think it can be a nurse, a midwife, a therapist of any kind. But sure, it takes the translation of, isn't that wonderful? that you bring as a professional, and then the parent dares to let their defenses down, their passion surge to the surface, and they're ready. And they start off with that baby as a person with respect. Well, in your book that you did with uh, Stan Greensburg, The Irreducible Needs of Children, there's a line, uh, right now children are learning more about frogs and other non-human species than they are about human beings. And what I was thinking about here... It's not my line. <laughs> uh -huh, ...is not so much uh, anything negative, but that we don't do enough helping all prospective parents understand what this new person in their life is going to be like. Well, I, I certainly can agree with that. I, th I wish that every new parent had a chance to share that new baby with somebody who could interpret for him. And this has been my dream, that someday every newborn uh, place around the world would, would share the baby with, with the new parent, because it makes a significant difference in their attachment process all the way along, and of course, in the baby's self-esteem and readiness to pick up on learning, to feel good about themselves, all of the things we dream about wanting. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but also to create a feedback right loop as one is encouraging the other. Well, you mentioned a moment ago about how when you um, got your medical training, you didn't know that much about children. Has that changed? Do pediatricians now have a better idea? Not enough. <laughs> We're trying to change it. We're working about with about five medical schools now, trying to give them this sort of message that the most important uh, language a pediatrician or a nurse or a nurse midwife has is her language about the baby, because the parents are absolutely starving for it. They're just hungry for it. And if you can reinforce it early, you keep it alive right straight through. And um, again, in Irreducible Needs, you talk about how children 
require, I'm reading it here, sensitive, nurturing care to build capacities for trust, empathy, and compassion, and also for learning, no? This is not just about emotional health. These are all connected. No, we think we, there's a new sort of phrase called affective learning, um, emotional learning, and I think it really talks about how learning goes on in the context of uh, feeling good about yourself and feeling related to other people, and without that, why you can still learn, obviously, but it's a different kind of learning. The kind of learning I'm talking about yeah. is a child who works, works, works at something, and then when he gets it, I just did it. And then he looks to his parent for, did you see what I just did? And without saying it, that parent automatically says, hey, that was great. And you've got two sources of fuel for the development of that child. And you also do that with the parents, don't you? When, when the parents succeed, you give them, you, you point out that they've succeeded for the very same reason, I think. They need it so much these days. The kind of stresses that uh, are there. I have 12 stresses that I think new parents are going through today that are significantly more than they were when we were raising our children. 30 years ago. Let's talk about that. You started practicing in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1950. And you just mentioned that you've identified, I think it's 12 stressors. Mm -hmm. um, talk about a few of them. The biggest one is the, what we've asked women to do. We have split women in two in this country. And we've asked them to be successful in the workforce. And we've made it, begun to make it possible begun, and we've asked them to go home at night and take care of the whole family. Well, my golly, those are two important roles, and women live up to that. They feel it, and their husbands are now trying to help out and trying to help, live, help them live up to this, but they're two major roles. Now, I think we have the solution to each of these stresses. I don't know whether you want to. Yeah, let's go two. there. Yes, that would be great. All right. The one in the workforce is, I would say, that businesses ought to be aware of the importance of what women need to back them up to be good at family support. They ought to be allowed to go out to their children's soccer games. They ought to be given uh, times to be away when they can recover from all of the stress they're under. And, you know, businesses ought to be helping. If At home, I would suggest one thing. Every new parent ought to have, be given a great big rocking chair. And when she gets home at night, she knows everybody in the family is going to fall apart. All the kids are going to start screaming at her. Her husband's going to come in saying, where is everything? I, everything's not ready for dinner tonight. And she, you know that. They're all going to fall apart. Never heard so, of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> as you walk in the door, instead of going to the toilet or to the bed to make it, just gather everybody up and sit down in this rocking chair and rock. And everybody's going to be bitching at you the whole time. But when you, they finally relax in your arms, look down and say, how was your day? And the baby will go, oh, well, mine was too. I missed you so much. And you're, how was your day? And he'll say, oh, awful. Well, mine was too. But now we're a family again. And then take them in the kitchen and let them help you. You know, let them become part of a working family. And, you know, this could bring back the feeling that we're all together in this. And I think this is what we've been losing out on. So we can do it. Well, what you just said raises many questions, but the first one I have to ask you because I don't want to be inundated with mail or emails. Why the mother? Right. Why not the father? Right. Well, you, you saw by my playing with babies that I believe in the father and that I think the father is a critical actor in this, particularly in this day and time. And fathers respect that. Seconds you give them Oh, an okay to go ahead, they are ready. They are all ready. 
What we haven't really realized is that there's bound to be gatekeeping between two adults who care about the same child. I call it gatekeeping competition. And of course, a mother and a father are in competition with each other for that baby, of course. If we don't give fathers permission by including them in their child's t caretaking in all the interviewing, then they're not going to get into that role because they see the mother feeling very protective and they just don't get in. We have four kid children. I, uh, my wife says she has five, and I have four, and they're not the same children at all. I wouldn't raise the children like she raises them. I'd be raising them differently. I want to write a book. That's right. So we talk every week about how competitive we feel. Gets rid of it. <coughs> Helps it. You talk about, though, the fact that we're working towards a new balance between the fathers and the mothers. Um, I don't want to reflect uh, some kind of gender bias to say with any two people somebody has to break the tie whether it's who's going to stay home who's going to make decisions where do you see that new balance going? I, th I see it as a team working together and I, I think that the, the parents to whom you can give this kind of challenge and keep it alive over the child's development, it is, it is more like a team than it used to be. You know, I turned over our children to my wife and then bitched, and you probably did too, I can nah. tell by your face. <laughs> Never did. did. Never did. <laughs> well, I'm very jealous of how close she is to him now. <laughs> <laughs> well, much of what's happened is a question of the increase in mother's work. Uh, this is the change that's ha happened in the last 30 or 40 years. And I know that you don't give people advice, but when a young woman or a young couple come to you and say, we're thinking of having a baby, uh, and we're think, trying to decide about who works, how, and so forth. What do, you, what do you either say or what questions do you ask or how do you guide them to their own decision? Well, I'd, I'd like to see p my patients in pregnancy so they can unload with me two questions all pregnant women have, pregnant women and men have. One is how will I ever get to be a parent? I don't want to be like my parent because for sure, and yet they know they will be. <laughs> so that's the conflict. And then the other is, what kind of baby can I nurture? And then they'll describe the perfect baby that looks in their face and has hair and a perfect face, you know, as a three-month-old baby. <laughs> and then they'll describe, if you ask them to, the impaired baby that they might have. And then you've got them talking about something very deep-seated. And if parents together can begin to share that impaired baby that everybody dreams about before delivery, then they'll tell you all sorts of things. And I think parents are ready then to start thinking with you, you know, what's most important in our lives? Is it money? Is it uh, you know, all of the things we blame women for. And women can even begin to think, you know, it's going to be important for me to stay home for a while. And if I can keep them home, and I, I don't tell them, but I listen and re encourage uh, for the first few months so they can make that initial attachment to their babies, it, it goes so much more easily then. And then they'll fight for what they need in the way of, you know, if they're breastfeeding, they'll fight to get milk to bring home to their babies, things like that. And I think we need to really think how hard it is for parents today if they don't get the backup that I'm yeah. urging. Well, you mentioned about those first few weeks, and I've had a number of young people working for me, who, women who I, I'm quite sure did not expect to go right back. I did not expect to stay home with their babies even for a few months. 
And the phrase I've heard is, I fell in love with my baby. What is that all about? Is that? Um, well, look at your smile. Look at your eyes sort of get dim as you talk about babies. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When a baby looks you in the face, your heart starts going like this. Your whole body begins to soften and you get when that baby goes, Ooh, or when that baby smiles at you, it's it's like a love you've never, um, it doesn't matter how much you care about your spouse, it's a different kind of love, a different kind of commitment that I think just happens around a baby. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to push this a little bit now. Let's assume that the world is changing, which is good. Women have more choices. But when both parents are working, um, what I read tells me, for example, um, that both of them, but especially the mothers, have difficulty setting limits. They come home, they've been away. So let's talk about those kinds of things. We hope they have great child care. We hope that well, their employers are supportive of them. Hope is not enough. We need to have optimal child care. And there are places in this country that have faced that. Governor Hunt in North Carolina has optimal child care around North Carolina. California is using tobacco money to improve child care. Uh, Maine has just made a big statement about child care. Miami, Florida is beginning. People can do it. We've got to have optimal child care, and we don't have it now. That is so true. Now, I've seen, you've written about institutional care, as in child care. What kinds of things do you want child care programs to do that they don't do today? Well, I want child care people who have gone into this because they care about children to be backed up with decent salaries, with uh, positions where people really respect them. I want parents to realize they're not just babysitters, that these people really care about their kids, and then to reinforce that. And so that the, the, the child care person looks in a baby. I tell mothers or fathers when they come to me about what to look for in child care, if this ba person looks at this baby the way you feel like you do, or if this person begins to imitate the baby's rhythms, you're already talking about somebody who cares about children. So I would look for that first if I were looking for child care. It looks to me that it's extremely difficult to get all the things one wants in an institutional setting. Sure. I was walking uh, in the park one day and there were two mothers with their children. And I don't remember whether the children couldn't tell whether they were four or three or whatever. And one little girl was walking along. It was a little bridge, a little two by four, no, no fence. And the little girl right, walks along on that two by four. On one side is the bridge, and on the other side is a five foot f drop. That mother is looking very carefully at her daughter, but she's going to let her. She was letting her do. It was quite clear. She was ready to jump, but she wanted her daughter to have that kind of independence. I see that, and then I see the young children being brought out from some of the daycare centers, and I'm sure there are wonderful ones, but I see them all you know, tied together or in these strollers where there are six babies and, and one um, caretaker. And I say, whatever that, and I watched your face get a little worried about that child walking along, but I say, um, you know, that's, we want, without risks, we want that kind of freedom for the children in care as well as at home. And I don't know how we are going to get to that kind of more flexible. I don't, I don't either, Doug, but I, th I agree with you. I wish we had that as a major goal in this country. We know what to do for children and for parents. Parents are grieving just as much as you and I are about what they're having to do today in terms of leaving their kids without that kind of uh, opportunity. And you see that in your 
Oh, practice, of course. Don't Good heavens. People who know they're going to have to leave their child to go back to work start grieving in pregnancy. It's, people are suffering, and we are not doing a damn thing at a national level. It's time we took it back and said our children are our future. If we don't pay attention to what they're going through, the way of institutionalizing women who we split into, uh, we, had, we are going to pay a terrible price. We're already paying it. Well, I, I'm, I keep going to what's happening now as opposed to the better world because people will be watching this program for many years and I hope child care will improve, but it's going to take many years. So let me go back again. Well, now Europe has already done it. Europe has wonderful child care, most parts of Europe, and even Asia, many parts of Asia have superb child care. You know, what's wrong with a country like ours that doesn't pay attention to this? T. Barry Breselton, thank you very much for being with us. Great, Doug. Thank you. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland.